posting embed. I just think this stuff is so incredibly cool. Well, I think this is neat because we pay all this money for this video tech that I don't think is any better than this. Yeah, I, I think that's true. Um, I just canceled a webinar service, hmm. perhaps prematurely, but um, <laughs> because you can do screencasts with this technology as well. What's a screencast? Uh, screencast is, or screen sharing rather, is I can run, say, a slideshow on my screen right. or a video, and anyone watching can see it. There's a very persistent cat trying to get Yes. I this is her cell phone ring. Oh, hello. Bolivia. Hello. Hello, Bolivia. She uh, generally comes out of hiding when I'm talking to someone else. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, so you can do. Uh, uh, yeah, so all the stuff that you would normally do with go to meeting. Exactly. I think, exactly. In fact, the reason we didn't is I think there's like a maximum of ten or something on a screen. That's true. That's true. Maximum of ten on the screen. Yeah. With this technology, though, an unlimited number of people can watch. Right. So, right. I'll, yeah. I'll keep trying it with free events and then see, you know. No, I think it's a good idea because I because I, none of the pay services are that good. That's right. You know, they really all... aren't. They really aren't. Okay. Well, okay. I think we have liftoff here, Michael. So I just checked. Uh, <laughs> da da da. Welcome everyone. I'm Molly Gordon, and I'm here with Michael Neal. Um, Hello. Hey, Michael. Michael is a dear friend and a oh, my video just went away. Um, hmm. We were joking about what could go wrong. Okay, so here we are again. <laughs> I'm here with Michael Neal, who is a friend, uh, a wise coach, a best-selling author, and some time back I started to notice in Michael's writing, which I've followed for a number of years, a, a sea change, something different was coming through, and I really liked what I saw. And it turns out that what I was seeing was Michael's engagement with a body of work called The Three Principles. And so I've invited Michael here to talk about The Three Principles, his book, The Inside Out Re Revolution, which is The Three Principles at Work, and how all of this affects those of us who work for ourselves. So welcome, Michael. Thank you. I keep trying to figure out where to put my eyes on this screen. I, I know. <laughs> So, uh, anyway, yeah, yeah. How are you? I'm well, actually. I'm, I'm, I've got my sabbatical coming up. I'm off in two days. That's uh, right. I soon. noticed you've been uh, uh, stockpiling or pre-recording radio shows and yeah. all that yeah. good stuff. Yeah, that's something else folks should know. And I'll put a link up to this um, later on. Uh, is that Michael is a a host on Hey. Hay House Radio. What's the name of your program? Uh, HayHouseRadio.com. The show's called Super Coach. Great. HayHouseRadio.com. Super Coach. Really wonderful show. Uh, you can call in to talk to Michael, and he also shares the principles and teaches about them. I've listened to a number of their shows, the shows, and they're really quite lovely. So. And I'll do. I'll do a little plug for a specific show this Thursday. Great. If you're watching this live. I'm interviewing Dr. Aaron Turner, who's one of the, the leading teachers of these principles, uh, and, and it, I, we pre-recorded the interview, so I can safely say it's brilliant. <laughs> uh, and that'll be Thursday at noon Pacific. And you can find it at HayHouseRadio.com. So. That's great. That's great. So, so, just to orient people, Michael, how did you come to the principles? I mean, you have a long background in personal development and effectiveness and success and all of those good things. So what brought you to the principles and what's different here? Well, I've been 
seeking in one way or another for a long time. And, and, and at first I was just seeking my way out of misery. And, and occasionally I would seek my way into something deeper as well, but, but I never really knew what, and, and I kind of settled on the idea of happiness. I, I didn't bring my cat. I, you, you shouldn't have cats unless there's enough cats for everybody. But, I'm sorry. Okay. It's not fair. <laughs> I'll get a dog in later. It'll be fine. There you go. Um, <laughs> or a and, child. <laughs> well, exactly. Whatever. Same thing. Um, and 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 I think for me, the 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 best thing I'd found was NLP, mm. and it helped me a lot when I was going through the worst of my own depression and and and, and troubles. And it seemed to help a lot of my clients a lot. But there was something for me that I was aware of that was missing. And, and it was to do with the fact that we weren't the happiest people on earth. L like for me, if NLP was everything it was cracked up to be, we should have, if not been the happiest, most confident people on earth, at least we should have been incredibly peaceful and gotten along brilliantly. And I wouldn't say we got on any worse than anyone else, but we didn't. You know, if, if, if there was a... a I remember thinking, you know, if you went to a pub and there was a table of NLPers and a, a, a table of, um, you know, bricklayers, you wouldn't know which ones were the experts in psychology, and that that troubled me. And this isn't to pick on NLP, because actually you take a table full of any psychology. Uh, That's right. And, and in fact, the NLP people probably would look happy. Would look pretty happy. So it, it, it's it's really just relative. And. And, and so there was something about that that, that, that got me, and, and so I was always on the lookout for what else was out there, not so much to replace NLP, but, but that I could also use, that might have that missing link, might have that extra something. And I stumbled in 2007 across uh, a book called The Relation Handbook by Dr. George Pransky, who later went on to write the foreword to my book and become a, a great mentor and a great friend. And there was something about that book. I mean, I've read a lot of books. I've managed two bookshops, a psychology bookshop and a New Age bookshop. I read everything that, that, that came out in the 80s and 90s. And, and I just got to a point where I, I, I was quite jaded to what was new. And so there was something new in this book that I hadn't seen before. And I started studying, at the time they called it psychology of mind and health realization, and going back to see that there was this field that dated back to the 70s and that Richard Carlson, who I had heard of, who wrote the Don't Sweat the Small Stuff books, his training was in this field. George was his mentor. And I got very intrigued, and I, I thought I was going to go up there and find their secret formula, because they kept saying there is no secret formula. And I went, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I haven't paid sure. enough yet. When I pay you enough, you'll tell me the secret formula. Or, or, or I did occasionally think, well, you guys just don't know the secret formula, but I'll study you, and I'll be able to, to model it out, and I'll teach it back to you, and it'll be fair. Well, much to my surprise, I drank the Kool-Aid. I went up mm. there, I spent time with Keith Blevins and George Pransky and Linda Pransky and Dick and Bettinger and a lot of the old guard of principals teachers. And I discovered that there was a there there, that you know, that there was something substantive at core, fundamentally true about life, that somehow in my uh, search for the structure of subjective experience, which is how I thought of the work that I did, it hadn't occurred to me that there were levels beyond subjective experience, that there mm. was something behind subjective experience that was constant. And, and for me, finding constants in the, in the variable world of psychology and spirituality was life-changing. Mm. And that's what these principles are. They're three constants three things that are always present that are you can completely rely on doesn't mean they're always helpful because they're 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 impersonal they're not there to help you ah. they're just the forces at play in the same way as gravity isn't there to help you but it does help you and understanding it and understanding how it works has allowed us to do things like fly planes and 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 work on spines and and do all sorts of it, it explains things Right. And if you understand them at a deeper level, you can make use of them in more and more situations. Right. And that, for me, is the practical element of the principles. It is not only is it true, but the more deeply you understand it and see it at work, the easier it is to navigate life. Mm. 
Yeah. You know, what just came to me about gravity is uh, if, if you understand it, you can learn to fly planes, you can learn to design planes, but you also don't have to spend all day jumping, you know, yes. <laughs> trying to get off the ground and, you know, thinking, God, if I, if I just try Why harder, isn't this working? if yeah. I focused more, you know. Well, and I, I also don't have to offer sacrifices to the, the trolls that live under the ground and hold yeah. us to the earth. You know, because that's a lot of it. Is we have a lot of superstition about where our feelings come from, and 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 our moods, and and our thoughts, and and if we don't have an understanding of where they come from, or if we have a four hundred different understandings of where they come from, superstition is going to go rife because we all want to have some sense that we're not flying blind. And, yes. and if we think spinning around three times, spinning over our shoulder, and sacrificing a virgin to Baal is going to do it, well, that's what we're going to do. And when we discover we don't have to do any of that, it takes a lot off our minds. It takes a lot off our plates. and makes it easier to then deal with what's actually going on. Right. Right. You know, I love the flying blind analogy because, or metaphor, um, and I'm, I, I'm thinking about this in two ways or on two levels. One is a flying, not having to fly blind in terms of having a way to navigate, so some way to orient navigation, and now I can't remember the second one, so that doesn't matter. But for me, one of the things the principles does is, especially with this notion that I'd love you to talk about a little, of innate well-being, when I got that, it was like I was oriented around something so fundamental and, I don't know, I don't have real good language for this, but I felt that I could navigate, not as in this will tell me where to go, but this tells me where I am. Yeah. And from here, where to go will be apparent, or where to go is kind of a no-risk proposition. Is that making sense? It, it makes sense to me. I, I, <laughs> but then I, I already That's agreed scary. with you when we came on this. So. <laughs> I, I mean, I think for me, what, what it was for me is when I, the first big insight I had through the principles, and this is the way, when we'll talk about, or I, I, I'm planning, unless you stop me, I'll talk yeah. about um, you know, the, the principles and, and what they are, but there's the way that people understand this is through insight is you have little light bulbs moments little ahas little clicks in your mind and you just suddenly see something or you get it the way you get a joke right and the first joke i got the first cosmic joke i got is i had just finished a book called feel happy now which was my best expression of all the work that i had learned to do to not be miserable and to occasionally even be happy and, and I got pretty good at it. And if I did my behavioral Prozac, I, I went through all my rituals and, and techniques, I could create a fairly consistent experience of, of being OK and sometimes happy. Well, the first cosmic joke I got is I was born happy. That, that happiness, well-being is the word I tend to use, is my nature, is all of our natures. We are born into that. That's just what it feels like to be alive before our feeling gets contaminated by our thinking. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I laughed for about five minutes, and then I'd like to say I wept. I didn't weep, but I, inside I was like, oh my gosh, what, what am I going to do? I've built my entire business <laughs> around my ability to create something that already exists. So my well-being is guaranteed, <laughs> yeah. but my livelihood is shot. <laughs> Yeah, my livelihood's no, it's screwed. But I mean, you know, the well-being thing. I'm going to feel great as I as I get home. I'm lose everything. But but uh, you know, and it was it was it was a, it was a shock because I I had been a hundred percent sure I would have passed any lie detector test you gave me that this was something you had to work at, something that you could achieve, but you needed. You need to work, and I prided myself that I had found the easier ways that involve less work to create the, the, these good feelings. Ultimately, there's something that happens to people when they realize they don't have to to, to strive 
to be okay. It takes, it just takes a whole load off your shoulders. Hmm. Um, and it turns out we spend a lot of our time trying to be okay, trying to be happy, trying to not be sad, trying to avoid bad feelings, get more good feelings. And when you suddenly realize that you actually don't need to do that, because even when your feelings go up and down and you have you know, highs and lows, there's this background sense of fundamentally okay. You know, in the well of your being, you know, mm -hmm. fundamental well-being. Suddenly, you're free to look at life in a very different way because you're no longer inclined to do things in order to be happy. Mm. And that frees you up to do things that create results. If you're interested in creating results, in the world. that frees you up to really connect deeply with the people around you. If you're inclined to connect deeply with the people around you, because you're there, because there's no other demands on your head because you don't have to do anything in order to be okay, in order to be happy. And, you know, I know, I, I've talked to enough people now in the, in the last six years about this to know that for some people, even hearing me say that is a huge relief. Yes. For other people, there's a sense of, okay, I kind of get that, but, and for some people, I just sound nuts. And that's that's cool. Yeah. Like, but, <laughs> you know, you're here, you can look at Molly's cat. It, it, you know, it, it will get onto something that will be helpful, I'm sure. Should we talk about the principles? Would that be? Yeah, please do. Um, as when I was first studying this, the principles was, to me, the least interesting part of it. I was interested in the implications and applications. Mm -hmm. So I didn't care about, yeah, 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 there's three universal principles that underlie everything in life. Great. You know, what do I do to make more money? What do I do to be happy? <laughs> what do I do to have a better relationship with my wife and kids? You know? Right. And yet, what I found as I've gone deeper into this work is that actually it is an understanding of these principles that leads to all of those wonderful things that we go that, that we're that we're all interested in, mm -hmm. um, you know, that make up a wonderful life from the outside. So the principle I usually start with is is the principle of mind, and 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 again, these are just constants. These you know, some things are just true. These are just yeah. things that are just are, whatever language you have for them. I sometimes call this one the God principle, mm -hmm. because that's what it most closely resembles, is the way that people think about God. There is an energy and intelligence behind life. There is an intelligent unfolding to life. There is not a philosophy, including atheism and, and Buddhism and Jehovah's Witnessism, and you know, there is not a philosophy or a religion that does not take that into account, that there is something more to life than meets the eye. In, in, in quantum physics, they've been talking for, 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 for energy of life, the unified field that we are all a part of. The e equals mc squared, Einstein's theory of relativity, was saying, hey, yeah, there's all this stuff, there's all this matter, but at a certain speed, it's all just energy. It's all the same thing. It's all relative. Right. Well, we are part of that field. That field is ever present in our lives. Now, the manifestations of that, the implications of that, turn out to be somewhat huge. Because we often act as if we're the ones who have to figure it all out. We're the ones who are supposed to have all the intelligence. We're the ones who are supposed to make things happen. And you absolutely can, within this world of mind. Mm -hmm. And so at a personal level, we have our personal mind and that creates our experience of life. And at a, a more universal level, there's you know, what we might call a universal mind, this intelligent energy behind life that's unfolding. And, and the interplay between the personal and that universal is, is, where the, is where things start to change for people. Because when you start to see that you, you don't have to be self-reliant Mm. You can actually rely on something much, much, much more reliable than you will ever be, no matter how disciplined you get, yeah. and something that will always be there, no matter what, and something that already has an energy and a momentum and an unfolding to it. And that, when people start to see that, again, I, I find I'm saying this phrase a lot, I guess today, but it takes the pressure off. No kidding. No kidding. Uh, 
you know, I use the analogy a lot. I, I, I actually saw it, I'll use a different one, because I saw it in a supermarket yesterday. There was a kid, and his mom was pushing him in a trolley, and, and he was in this, he had a, the trolley was like a car, and he was steering the car. Well, he thought he was steering this trolley. He was like really watching out for me and trying to do things. Well, his mom was steering the car, really steering the trolley, but he didn't know that yet. And there will come a time where that game wouldn't make much sense to him to play anymore because he'd get that there's someone else pushing the trolley. Well, it's the same thing for us. When we start to see that there's somebody else pushing the trolley, it doesn't mean we can't have fun and spin our wheels, but we really are just spinning our wheels. Right. You know, and whereas when we engage with what wants to happen, with, with futures that are emerging, mm -hmm. as they talk about in leadership forums, we have a completely different experience. Yeah. You can explore these these all day, but let me let me kind of move on. So the, sure. the, the second principle, the second constant, the th second thing that is always at play is consciousness. And and consciousness in, in the inside out revolution I describe it like the developing fluid for mental photographs. For mental photographs. Photographs. So consciousness is what brings our thinking to life and gives us an experience of of life. Sen sensorily, sensually, sen whatever the word would be, <laughs> through the senses, via the senses. And, and without consciousness, there would be no experience. So I sometimes liken consciousness to, um, you know, I'll use it in an analogy of uh, a movie theater. And in, you can, there's different ways to do this, and I'll play with them, but, but I sometimes liken consciousness to the screen. Mm -hmm. If you just project a movie into space, you can't see anything. You don't experience the movie. You need the screen to experience the movie. And consciousness is like that screen. It, it's what allows us to experience life. And the reason that it's worth knowing about is because how big or small that screen is at any given moment has a huge impact on what we think we're watching. And a, as our sense of our own consciousness contracts, mm -hmm. our world gets very small. And if we don't know that that's what's changing, it's not that the world has suddenly changed. It's that the screen we're viewing it on has suddenly shrunk down, so it's only showing us part of the picture. We're liable to, to have poor judgment quite innocently mm. because we'll be basing our judgments on a very limited view of what's going on. Whereas when the screen expands, which is its natural state, so we'll always go back to expanded, well, then we can see more of the big picture. Then we can navigate with better information and then we'll have a, a deeper experience of life. The third principle is thought. And, and thought is like the clay of creation. You know, Sid Banks, who's the, 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 the philosopher who sort of identified these things, he didn't create them because they were already there, but he kind of named them. He went, oh look, that, that, and that. And you mix them up and you get all experience in life. Well, thought is the content. Thought is the force, the creative force, that allows us to experience a variability of life. Because if it was just mind and consciousness, we would just experience this constant hum that the mystics talk about, the om mm -hmm. of life. That's all there would be. But thought creates the infinite variety of life. Now that's mm -hmm. a blessing and a curse. It, it's an absolute blessing in the sense that everything that we value in life was created by a thought. It can be a bit of a curse because it's what distracts us from that underlying hum of well-being, of mind experienced through consciousness that's ever-present. Now, you know, explain the universe in five minutes or less. <laughs> you know, there, that, that, that's today's attempt. Right, um, right. I, I don't for a minute expect that people will go, oh, oh, okay, mind, conscious, and thought, great, my life's perfect now, see ya. Right, right. But it's a starting point for the conversation, and, and what I tried to do in Inside Out Revolution is, is start there and then begin to look at, well, how does that impact the way we learn? How does that impact the way we do business? How does that impact the way we relate? Mm -hmm. and, and how does that impact the way we experience our own moods and emotions and, and psychology? And I, I just find these endlessly fascinating questions. Oh, no kidding. No kidding. So do I. You know, on one level, when I first, as a result of something you wrote in your newsletter, I got online, I googled George 
Pransky. I found some videos of him at a Tikkun conference, um, T-I-K-U-N, for any of you who want to Google it. And I saw him talking about mind consciousness and thought, and I thought, okay, <laughs> fine. <laughs> and it... It, it didn't seem like news to me. It seemed it was very theoretical. I got it from here up and I said fine. But over time I kind of dropped down into it. And it uh, well it's just um, <laughs> it often reduces me to speechlessness. <laughs> so yeah, they, they, we, we sometimes talk about the principles as the great conversation killer. Yes. You know, what's wrong? <laughs> Thought. Mm, well, uh, what are you going to do about it? Mind. Mind, right. <laughs> How will you know, consciousness? <laughs> well, I'll pick up on something you said about um, self-reliance and how mind gives us a break that when we understand the principle of mind from that always looking to, you know, continuous, I've called it compulsive serial self-improvement. Yeah. And the pressure of that. Well, it's curious, you know, I, I'm realizing that, you know, I'm seeing on my screen that this, this is called self-employment from the inside out. And I think it's easy to confuse, to think, well, if I'm self-employed, then I need to be self-empowered and self-reliant. Self-reliance is a stage in development. Mm-hmm. You know, Stephen Covey years ago wrote about the three stages going from dependence to independence to interdependence. Well, self-reliance is that independent stage where I discover I do have a free will. Mm -hmm. I do have choice. There are things that I can do. And compared to the, the victimness of dependence, self-reliance, self-empowerment seems like the greatest thing since sliced bread. And, and if you get stuck there, you quickly begin to find its limitations. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it, it's like thinking that the only way to get across the ocean is in a motorboat. Mm -hmm. but so, so being a victim is, well, I've got a boat, but there's no motor, there's no engine. You know, Self-reliance, self-empowerment is beginning to discover, hey, there's an engine here. Or, you know, for, well, okay, there's oars, but hey, I can replace these oars with an engine when I do, you know, when I learn these self-help techniques. Oh, and then if I go and learn the turbo empowerment techniques, now I've got a motor. And if I want to really get across the ocean, I can get an even bigger motor. Well, you can play that game, getting a bigger and bigger engine, and learning more and more about self-care, caring for the engine, and, and all of that. But you could also unfurl the sails and take advantage of the wind, which is how people have been sailing the ocean for thousands of years. And 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 for me, that's sort of the the evolution. From it's not that self-reliance is bad. Right. It's, it's that it's like running on batteries when you could be plugged into the mains. Right. It does do something for you, just not as much as is actually available. Right. And I love that you pointed out that it is a, a developmental stage. That we, in my experience and understanding, we don't go from uh, from zero to sixty without passing through forty and fifty. You know, there is yeah. a an evolution, a development to our understanding. Um, what though, because you've coached a lot of people around being successful in business, mm -hmm. how does this change the way you work with them? Um, well, you get, it, what was one of the programs we came up with? You get double the results with half the effort, none of the stress. <laughs> That's all. And that's you know, look, the, the, you know that that's the, the the clever pitch language, but it's also a fairly accurate description of what happens for most people, because what you see is that a lot of the effort that goes into running our businesses is is because we're running around blind, mm -hmm. because we're trying to navigate by a formula that only sometimes applies to what's actually going on in our business, because we're trying to navigate just blind. We don't have any idea what we're doing and, uh, well, what do they say? Okay, let me go online and see what this expert says. You know, we're trying to follow other people's wisdom and so we run around and it's like, you know, when I take my, my puppy for a walk, 
he runs three miles for every one that I hike. Now, he's a puppy. He doesn't mind. And I've right. met young entrepreneurs who go, isn't it great? I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Woo Another you know, mocha. <laughs> you know, but there comes a time, you know, I, you know, making myself sound old, but, you know, there comes a time where sustainability starts getting interesting to us. And to be able to create the same or better results without the stress, because the stress is all added in by misunderstood thought. We can talk about that. Without all the effort, because a lot of the effort is there, because <clears throat> we're trying to prove something about ourselves. We're trying to prove we're enough. We're disciplined enough. We're committed enough. You know, everyone was wrong when they told us not to go be self-employed and that we'd wind up, you know, homeless on the streets. You know, we're trying to. We've got. A, there's a lot of effort that goes into trying to make yourself do things that you don't fundamentally want to do, and often that don't fundamentally need to be done. Mm. And you know, I would say, I'd go as far as to say three quarters of the effort is spent on things that create less than a, a, an eighth of the results. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I, that's just, I think there's an 80-20 in there somewhere. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, you know, and when you start to see that, that that's unnecessary, it stops seeming like a good idea to do that. Well, suddenly you've got all this energy and clarity and focus to bring to your business. Well, you bring your best self to your business every single day, most of the time. And you don't blow energy on <clears throat> trying to make yourself feel better or trying to prove something to yourself or someone else. You're going to do very, very well. It doesn't mean everything you touch is going to succeed, but it tilts the odds in your favor. And anyone who's, who's spent any time in, in Vegas knows that you only have to tilt the odds in your favor a tiny little bit to break the house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The another piece of that, uh, and you've used the analogy, and I've heard George use it as well about playing with the house's money. Yeah. You know, I've, yeah. I've, there's a, a saying that's been around for years. What would you do if you knew you could not fail? And I like to you say, what? Oh, there you go. <laughs> My version is, what would you attempt to do if you knew that failure was an option? Yeah. <laughs> well, and it's true. It, you know, I used to say, you know, what would you attempt if you knew you didn't have to be unhappy about not succeeding? There you go. Um, it's the same idea. Mm -hmm. And 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 essentially, the analogy that I, I I write about in the Inside Out Revolution is: imagine because you're so good looking, and creative, and fun, and people are drawn to you naturally because of your charisma. I'm so um, glad you noticed that. <laughs> um, I'm going to hire you to work at my casino, and I want you. To, all I want you to do is gamble, and I'm going to give you. 100,000 in chips when you come in in the morning, or whenever it is. And and I want you to just go have fun gambling. And at the end of the day, if you've won millions, you're going to turn in all your chips and get 500 bucks. And if at the end of the day you've lost everything, you're going to go up to the cashier and they're going to hand you 500 bucks. How would you play? How much freedom would there be? How much creativity, how much willingness to risk would you have? if you knew you were playing with the house's money. Well, when we start to see that our well-being isn't dependent on the results that we create, mm. it isn't dependent on our bank balance, it isn't dependent on how our business is doing today, it starts to be like playing with the house's money. Because worst case, I'm going to be happy and love my life. Best case, I'm going to be happy and love my life. In one instance, I'm going to be happy, love my life, and drive a Porsche. In the other, I'm going to be happy, love my life, and ride a bicycle. I can't lose. Right. And if I can't lose, I'm free to play full out and fearless. And, and that's, you know, there's a whole chapter in the book on the paradox of results. That, you know, the, the, the less results matter to us, the easier it is to create them. And that's at the heart of why understanding these principles at a deeper level can make such a difference to people's businesses and why, you know, even though it sounds like I'm talking philosophy and even abstract spiritual philosophy a lot of the time, I still get hired by top achievers and am able to help them not just ground what they've already done, but continue to create results at even larger levels. Mm -hmm. Because we're just freeing up this resource of mind to work through them with less interference. We 
could you talk a bit more about thought and how thought creates experience and and especially people when I think there's confusion about okay so I get that thought creates my experience so how do I get a better class of thought yeah and and I think that's the <laughs> one of the early misunderstandings that almost everybody has when they start to learn the principles is it's the same thing with if I I'll take a brief detour into the law of attraction and the secret and things like that is what the what the law of attraction points to is that um, you know when we allow it things come to us that's attraction we become as we get clearer in our thinking as our vibrational level increases. Things are drawn to us, people are drawn to us, we are clearer, we start to notice opportunities. It's just mind and consciousness in action. There's less thought in the way. And so you're clear. Well, people come to the law of attraction <clears throat> from the school of acquisition, where they think more is better and I need to get in order to be okay. I need to consume. And so they consume the law of attraction as a, a new, better, shinier tool for acquisition. Instead of going out and getting it, I'm going to sit back and collect it. Right. But the emphasis is still that somehow it is going to be better than not it. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it thought, the thought-feeling connection works in a similar way. You know, I, I, I subtitled the Inside Out Revolution, the only thing you need to know to change your life forever. And the, the specific distinction that I was referring to in that subtitle is that we live in the feeling of our thinking. That the way thought and consciousness work is whatever we think, it, it's like the movie and consciousness is like the screen. We feel it. It brings it to life. It gives us an experience of it as if it's really happening. You know, a friend of mine um, uses the analogy of uh, it's like walking down the street with your best friend who's a close-up magic, he's a close-up magician and he keeps doing tricks and you keep falling for him. Well that's us with thought and consciousness is we keep thinking something outside us is creating our experience. But it's a trick of the light. Mm -hmm. It's always coming projected out from thought and then experienced back inside through mm -hmm. the senses. So the, the first mistake that people make when they learn the principles or they, they start to understand the thought feeling connection that we're living in the feeling of our thinking, not the feeling of of the outside world is is they think oh well I'm I, I, I'm a control freak so how do I control that right I, I in order to be safe I need to be in control so how do I control my thinking so I can have the feelings that I want right well the problem with that and I call that the sort of enlightened outside in approach mm -hmm. because we do get that that we're that it's our thought is connected to our experience but we somehow think that even the thoughts are variables to be manipulated outside us, as opposed to seeing that the, like, we don't have to breathe ourselves. Even though there are conscious breathing techniques and practices, you could never come across a conscious breathing technique or practice and you would still breathe. Well, even if you've never learned anything about how to control thought, about affirmation, about positive thinking, about anything like that, Thought would still work perfectly through you. You don't have to think. Thought will come through without you thinking it. And one of the reasons we don't notice that is because we're so busy up in our heads trying to think the right thoughts. Well, there's something really interesting that happens when we stop doing that. Mm -hmm. Is we start getting a better quality of thought. When we have freedom of thought, when, we, when the thought police go away, it's 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 you know it's like a nightclub without you know it's it's a party up there because any thought can come through, any possibility becomes possible, any experience becomes open to us, and in the same way as you know sometimes a horror movie's fun, sometimes you don't want to have anything to do with it. Sometimes an adventure movie's fun, sometimes you don't want to have anything to do with it. Sometimes a romantic comedy. If you allow your thinking to unfold, not only will you get to experience the fullness of life. But there's a whole class of thought that normally doesn't get through, except in special instances, mm. called insight. Mm -hmm. it, it's deeper thought. It's thought that seems to come from somewhere beyond our own memory and imagination. 
And those are the thoughts that change our lives. Those are the thoughts that change our world. Those are the thoughts that launch our businesses. Those are the breakthrough thoughts that everybody's chasing when they mm -hmm. do creativity workshops or brainstorming exercises. And those thoughts are part of the natural flow when we take our hands off the mechanism and let it work as designed. Yeah. Yeah. I, I find the notion of higher quality thought um, very useful. And, and as I say that, I'm thinking again, I want to distinguish that from trying to get a higher quality of thought. Yeah. So, what do you say to people who say, okay, I, I get that, um, that insight happens when I'm having a higher quality of thought, but I still want to know how to get a higher quality of thought? Well, so one of the contexts I'll sometimes put around the conversation is between physics and engineering. Mm -hmm. People have a lot of engineering questions because they don't understand the physics. And, and in terms of this, people have a lot of questions uh, that, that are, how do I? Mm -hmm. Because they don't really see the principles in action. They don't really have a, an, a, anything more than an intellectual grasp of the principles. And that's, of course not. You, know, mm -hmm. you, you won't until you do. Yeah. It's not necessarily a matter of time. Because people can grasp this in a heartbeat. Right. Because it's already present. It's not something new you have to learn. But, you know, your heart might beat for a while before that heartbeat comes. Yeah. But once you start to see how the, the how, you know, what thought is that it's this energy, and it fluctuates, and that creates this variability of experience. Once you start to see, well, what is an insight? Well, an insight is a fresh thought. It's mm. a new thought. It's, it's a thought I haven't thought before. It's a sight I haven't seen before. And then I, then, then I would kind of go back to, to, to basics and go, well, where does that thought come from? Well, where all thought comes from? Mind. It comes out of this universal intelligence. And some of it is useful and some of it is noise. Well, how do I get less noise and more signal? Well, if you start to understand that it's all coming from the same source, then you can also start to see that most of the noise is generated by you trying to generate your own thinking from in here instead of from wherever it is. Right, right. And so, well, gee, if I'm the one generating the noise and I'm trying to have less noise, maybe it would make sense to not think about stuff so much Yeah. in that way, to yeah. let my mind be reflective and receptive and not on. Right. Now, that doesn't mean never on. It just means when I'm looking for insight, the on function is is the noise that makes it harder to find insight. When I'm trying to analyze data, great, that's what this is for. But I'm not really trying to analyze data that much. Right, right. Because most of the stuff that's actually going to move me forward is in spite of the data or on top of the data or behind the data. Behind it. I was having a conversation with a woman yesterday who was curious about the principles and uh, for me it was a startling insight. During the conversation I got, we don't have to interpret our thinking. Mm. <laughs> we just let it alone and it's like, whoa, that saves a lot of time. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. You know, it's funny, I, I went to George Kransky once and, and I said to him, I said, George, don't be offended but I want to be stupid like you. And, 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 and he wasn't offended because he knew what I meant. Mm -hmm. is I wanted to get out of my head long enough for this deeper intelligence to kind of come through. And, right. and, and it isn't really getting stupid. I mean, I come from a very intellectual background, you know, you know mm -hmm. high achiever, PhD mom, and, and, and all that. And, 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 and so I had that kind of upbringing and I have that kind of brain. For me, it was when I was willing to let that take a back seat. My, mm -hmm. my, my much ballyhooed intellect I wasn't getting rid of it. I still have it. Right. It still comes in handy from time to time. 
But it turns out that it was a terrible thing to have running the show. Mm-hmm. Yes. You know, great servant, terrible master. Exactly. Great servant, terrible master. Um, and that's when it began to settle in for me. When mm -hmm. I kind of got over the idea that I was supposed to be the one who figured it all out. And and it's true. When you when you don't have a lot on your mind, it, it, it can people go, oh, he's a bit of an airhead. Well, kind of. But actually what, what's happening is you're creating space for something better to come through. Right. It's not an emptiness for its own sake, though it does feel nice too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is a space. I call it in my work the space where miracles happen. Because it's that space into which fresh new ideas come that can change your life, that can change your business, that can change the world. Right. And, and you talk to any creative artist, whether they're creative in the field of business, creative in the field of music, creative, they always talk about the great ideas coming through them or to them. You almost never hear a great artist or innovator saying, yeah, I did that. That's right. I mean, they That's might right. uh, up front, but actually, if you actually talk to them, as opposed to you know, yeah. your publicity statement, they'll all go, "Yeah, I don't know, man. I hope it happens again." Yeah, and not usually when they're chewing and grinding away on it. It's yeah. in the shower, on a walk. Yeah, and, 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 and it's 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 funny because a lot of them go, "Yeah, but if it wasn't for all the chewing and grinding away, I wouldn't have gotten it when I went on the walk." Right. And that's something that I I would encourage people to play with. Yes. Because my experience is there's a lot less chewing necessary than you might think. Yeah. But play with it. Yeah. Play with it. That's my experience as well. When I have reflected, because a lot of my work over the years and my approach to things has been if I do enough self-examination, and I want to distinguish that from the kind of reflective thinking you've been talking about, if I examine and question myself enough, and deconstruct things enough, I will have an insight. And over the years, I have had a lot of insights. What I really got curious about when I first discovered the principles was, did those insights come as a result of the examination? Or did they just come? And more and more, I think they just, they just showed up. And I'm no longer convinced that I had to do the digging and pushing and pulling and door opening and shadow work and yada, yada, yada. Um, well, what, and I don't what, read a bit of it. I mean, I love my courage. Absolutely. And, you know, what, one, one of the reasons that I've, I've come to see that there's a lot less required than I thought is that I teach new people. So whether you know they, they read the book and they've never come across the principles before, they do uh, an online living from the inside out, they come on the Super Coach Academy to learn to teach this, to, to coach from this. The people with the least training often get it the quickest. Yeah. Because they don't have all this thinking in the way about how it's supposed to work. They haven't built up all the superstitions yet. Right. So they can just see it. It's like, oh, that bird in that tree? Yeah, I see that. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas I was going, well, yes, I'm sure there is a bird in the tree, and, and, and yes, I know there's birds in that tree. I mean, yes. you don't have to tell me. I've talked, I've, ta I've written books about, you know, and I never look. Right. It's like, whereas I understand the, the ecology of trees. <laughs> you know, where, whereas the second I actually look, because there's a bird in the tree, I'm likely to see it. Yeah. And I don't have to do anything. I just have to look in the right direction. And, and that's what the principles kind of help point people towards is, Look to that deeper resource of mind. Mm -hmm. Look to that intelligent energy behind life. Mm -hmm. Look to the nature of consciousness. Look to the nature of thought. And you're going to see stuff. Right. And those, those kind of insights become what we call vertical insights. You know, so, so a horizontal insight is like, oh, this is what I can do about this problem. Oh, this is how I'm going to solve this problem. Oh, now I know what to do about this goal. Well, those are great. But we also have vertical insights where we suddenly go, oh, it, I, I'm not dependent on my results to be okay. Oh, I can just live in the world without having to micromanage everything. Oh, I'm part of this extraordinary energy. I'm, I'm like part of life at a level I never knew. And, and that's what richens and deepens mm -hmm. our experience of life. Mm -hmm. And, and they both happen. They're both just functions of the system. 
Right. Right. You know, I'm thinking about the people I work with in self-employment and how often how often over the years they have come and still come with technical questions. Should I blog? Should I do a newsletter? Um, is it time to remodel my news my website? Why is it so hard to market? Yada yada yada. And I I would say very very rarely, almost never, has the answer they have needed to move themselves or their business forward come from a decision tree about the right tactic or strategy. The, the ones that have really moved them forward have been some insight into often how am, I, how am I relating to this thing that I'm seeing as my business? How am I or am I even connecting to what inspires me to work with people? Uh, well, how can I help? How can you, I help? Yeah. You know, I mean, that's, that's one of the most missed questions that I see is, is people are looking for and I don't mean this, it's not as cynical as it sounds. It, it's kind of, it, it's like, well, how little do I have to do and how much can I get? Yeah. It's the question that a lot of people are trying to build their businesses around. Mm -hmm. and, and the question that actually creates a value exchange is, you know, how can I help and do I want to? Right, right. And if I can and I want to, I probably will. Yeah. Yeah. And this... Looking in that direction of mind, consciousness, and thought. Well, talk to be talk a bit about that whole phrase. Look in the direction because yeah, that you use that. A lot of people use that. I know it was one of those things that drove me nuts because I kept. I, I would always think when somebody said that. Just tell me which direction it is. Exactly. Show me the friggin' arrow. <laughs> you, you know, and 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 it's, and I, I almost have to just bombard it with metaphors. Okay. You know, look within. Mm -hmm. Look to the truth behind the appearance. Mm -hmm. Look to mind. Look where you don't know where to look. Um, look away from the noise towards what's yeah. creating the noise. Yeah, um, you know, look, look to the silence between the notes. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the 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 problem is we're look. It's look to the unknown. Yeah, not, not what you haven't yet learned, but the unknown, the space out of which knowledge emerges and thought emerges. You know, look. It's almost as much about knowing where not to look. That's, yeah, don't, that was what was coming to me. Don't look in your head. Don't look in, 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 the, in, in, in how other people have done it. Don't look in what you've done in the past or what you've learned in the past. And, and if you stop looking in those places, chances are you'll catch a glimpse. Right. And, I, and, and you know, it's funny. Uh, the phrase that, that gets kicked around a lot in the principles world is look look in a direction and do nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the bit that's usually missed out is the look in a direction. Yeah. People just hear do nothing and go, well, what do you mean do nothing? I'm running a business. I can't do nothing. Right. You, that's not the, it's not that. It's you know less effort doesn't mean no work. Right. 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 It 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 simply means that you're not pushing to do things that don't need to be done. You're not pushing yourself to do things that you fundamentally know not to do. You're not trying to make yourself into a different kind of person. Mm -hmm. There will be work involved in any endeavor that involves creating something in the outside world, but it can be effortless work. It can be work that is so natural that it doesn't occur to you until eight hours later that you need lunch. <laughs> you know. That's that's what's on offer. Not do nothing like I'm just going to sit and wait for it all to come to me. I don't have to do anything to see other than not. Right, right. That's the I, sense in which we mean do nothing. Yes, yes. I I think in terms of of listening sometimes too. And I was writing a blog post, I don't know, last week or the week before, and was ruminating on the the notion of of wisdom and where does this higher quality thought come from 
and what I got is it's it's not uh, the higher quality thought is not embedded in the debate that's going on inside. Like you don't find the voice of wisdom by choosing which of the competing voices in your head to listen to. <laughs> it's, like, it's not a member of the debating society. And so somehow listening for that quiet place, um, looking in the direction of, I often talk about just look in the direction of what you don't know. You come at this as, as if you don't know the answer and maybe even there's nothing you need to know that won't become apparent. Yeah, and I think that's that that's the whole thing is like it's even kind of comical us trying to come up with a uh, a, a formula for how to go to the place where there are no formulas. Mhm. Mm yeah. You know, the whole point is there isn't that there is simply this possibility, this this energy is we're already in it. Right. We're already of it. Right. So there's nothing to do in that sense to, to get wisdom from it. It's what comes through us. Mm -hmm. But we can mess with it. We can ignore it. We can block it. We can throw up so much noise in our own heads through our own thinking and trying to work it out. Is this wisdom? Is this wisdom? Is that, that we miss it. Right. You know, George uses the analogy of, of you know, trying to hear a piccolo in the midst of a marching band. You know, if, if the whole band, if you've got the marching band in your head, it's harder to hear the piccolo. When the marching band moves on, it's easy to hear the band. Right. I'm going to circle around and see how this lines with you to back around to innate well-being, because that's often where uh, I look in that direction, or more remember that direction, and somehow remembering that, which is the best word I can come up with in this moment quiets the marching band yeah. and in the confidence in that and a kind of direct experience of that which which I've noticed can I can apprehend that innate well-being whatever's going on with my moods and whatever's going on in the noise of my life if I just kind of look in that direction and get curious about that underlying truth that things quiet down sooner or later, and that's when I get insight. Well, and it, 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 it's it's funny that, that I like the phrase that you use. And I might not get it exactly right, but I, it is 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 that you know you can feel it regardless of what's going on with your moods. Mm -hmm. Is this is this is a background presence that this isn't how I'm feeling today? Oh, I'm I'm in it today. I'm not in it today. You're always in it. Mm -hmm. And you might be in it and also having this, you know, sad feeling or angry feeling or scared feeling. And, and, it, and it's really interesting as somebody who sort of was obsessed with which feelings I was feeling and trying to make sure I felt the right feeling in the right situation. To kind of not care what I'm feeling at that level. Yeah. Because behind that is this fundamental okayness. And, right. and for me, there is something about remembering is neat. But experiencing is neater. Yeah, I'm very articulate. I wrote books, but but, <laughs> but, 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 but but what I mean is that it's nice to be able to just go outside and check what the weather is, and not have to remember that right. there's a sky. It's right. nice to be able to see the sky from time to time. And so, anything that you do that helps you see the sky is great. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's nothing you need to do because the sky's there anyway. Right, right. Wow. This is just so rich. The What you just said returns me to, and again, I, I find myself particularly inarticulate sometimes talking about the principles and their implications. But there is a, a simplicity, a directness, and a kindness, those three things in this understanding, that... I just find it's phenomenally liberating, but also it just feels so damn good. And I don't mean happy, everything's going to be okay, good. And there is just a, it's like a coming home. Yeah. And from being home 
all kinds of shit can happen in me, outside of me, around me, because of me. But being home is non-negotiable, unalterable. And from that, looking in that direction of home, that's always available to me. That's always available to me. And that, and, and that, if I can bring it sort of full circle, that's something you can rely on. Mm -hmm. And that, that reliance will absolutely serve you in every area of your business. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Well, Michael, I want. Would you give the Hay House Radio information again? Yeah, let me let me give a few. So, uh, yeah. so HayHouseRadio.com is we do a weekly radio show Thursdays at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. UK. And August 1st, um, Dr. Aaron Turner is my guest. We're doing a show called It's Simpler Than You Think. And we talk about this. In, it, it, it was a really great, I took notes. It was a great conversation. Um, InsideOutRevolution.com is where you can get the book, learn about the book, um, find out about programs that we have connected to the book. Um, and if you're interested in, in, in bringing this into your coaching or using this in your work, I'm going to put in a plug for SuperCoachAcademy.com which is uh, a program where we're going to be running over nine months in 2014 with some of the, the just world's leading three principles teachers and I'll be there live and virtually um, taking people through that program as well. Excellent. Well, I put those uh, URLs into the comments for this event and Michael, thank you so much. We did this on short notice and played with a brand new technology and and thank you, too, for being you and for bringing this into my life. I'm just com completely and endlessly grateful. So. Thank you. This is great fun, Molly. All take right. Care. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye.